our next guest is Elizabeth Scott, who uh, is wearing one of her many hats here today, and, and we're also going to refer to one of her previous hats as well. Her current title is the Chief Media and Digital Officer for the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts, but she came there improbably, although as it turns out, not so improbably, from another position as the Vice President for Major League Baseball Productions. And I wanted to ask Elizabeth um, to start off by talking maybe about your formerly a little bit and about the kinds of things that you learned about audiences for baseball and how they kind of bridge to the, the, the path that you've traveled and what, we can, what they teach us about, uh, about audiences for classical music as well and for orchestras. Absolutely. Well, good afternoon. Thank you uh, to all of you for being here and to the San Francisco Symphony for inviting me to join this conversation. Um, about audiences, which matter for every kind of uh, entertainment that's out there, and certainly something that baseball's focused on all the time, and we in the performing arts uh, have to keep front and center. Um, things that I learned at baseball, I, I spent uh, a good 12 years at Major League Baseball, um, the first few years in a legal capacity, uh, which actually informs some of the rights issues that uh, impact a lot of what we're going to be talking about today and have been talking about. Um, but for the substantial part of that time as the Vice President of, of, of Programming and Business Affairs from MLB Productions. So my perspective is, is uniquely skewed by, by that of a, a, a storyteller, um, that of someone with uh, responsibility for stewarding and archiving the great history of the national pastime in the, in the archive that was the MLB Productions archive. Uh, and from that perspective, I, I can tell you, I had the pleasure of being in and, um, and amongst the game for that period of time where digitally a revolution took place at which sport and baseball particularly was at the, at the forefront. Um, in the period of my time there, the uh, individual clubs aggregated all of their online rights and assets into one space uh, under what you all know as MLB.com uh, probably, Major League Baseball Advanced Media, um, and, and in that position of aggregated content, uh, a stronger, stronger position, I think, for content than disparate little places. Um, uh, sport roared forward and deployed technology in ways that I think we can all agree has been tremendously impactful for engaging audiences. Uh, and something that I think, I think performing arts uh, can't do and can look to as, as we look to make our way in, in, in a space where things are just moving so, so quickly. I, I like to think of us um, as juggling or tap dancing in, in shifting sands or quicksands of ever you know, dimension, well, say, ever fractionalizing channels, um, ever multiplying devices, H how do we deal with this? Um, and, and I think one thing I've learned from being at baseball is that being proactive in that space has been essential um, for, for the success of sport and will need to, to be essential for the success, uh, the continued success and relevance of, uh, of performing arts. Um, uh, being able to leverage, not just seeing it as a challenge, but actually as an opportunity, being able to leverage technology in a way to give more ways and, and, and impactful ways in to what it is that we do. Sport has absolutely done that. Uh, performing arts can certainly do that and, and do that more. Mm. One of the things I wanted to pick up on, and because it, it made me think of it, uh, the, the local collection, connection here, one of the things that you were involved with was the, um, the great, um, Documentary about the Giants season that, yes. you, that you all did was, was HBO, I think. Uh, on Showtime, actually, Showtime. yes, Showtime, the, the yes. league's first uh, docu docu series reality show. Uh, yeah, it's, may, it's maybe maybe some of you saw it or franchise. certainly were aware of it during the Giants' great run. There, it happened to be during their uh, during their World it, Series season. It immediately followed their immediately season followed. as they looked to defend that championship. It, exactly. Uh, exactly. I mean, that kind of storytelling, which was is, is was technological, was about sort of breaking down barriers of yes. going places in the clubhouse and places in, pay, in players' homes. How might that sort of thing work in, in the arts world? I mean, can you see an analogy there? Or? Uh, absolutely. Uh, that, that's an example of where uh, w we at MLB Productions look to get increased access, access we didn't have as a matter of right under our collective bargaining agreements. Right? So both sport and, and performing arts li live in that unique world that has a business structure that is formed by the challenges and, and, and the realities of union labor negotiations. So that kind of access was access that needed to be secured, needed to be won over from, from, uh, from the unions. And I, I can tell you that the, um, th there was fairly quick recognition on, on, quote, both sides as to what the power of giving that kind of access to the consumer could, could be. It just had to be mediated and, and negotiated as to how we might do that. 
um, but what it means to, you know, to travel with the, with the team on the road, to have cameras in places that you don't uh, typically ha have them, is to give access to audiences. A access is a form of, of status for us. It, 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 it gives us power as, as consumers, right? Knowing what goes on behind the scrim. Uh, and, and that is something that we, we might look to do in, in any number of ways with, uh, with, with the performing arts. Historically, the performing arts have, have made meaningful access into the rehearsal process a fairly verboten thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a highly and, and sensitively negotiated at the collective bargaining agreement uh, table, as I understand it. Um, we, we might look to, 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 to experiment a little bit more in that space. Um, an example of that, even for sport, this most recent spring training, which I was not associated with as I was in my new role already. Uh, and, and again, nimbleness and experimentation, I think, is an important thing that we can, we can look to, to, to adopt as we're finding our way. There was a willingness to experiment with what it might mean for every player to wear a mic during a game um, in some of this, this most recent, uh, uh, recently played spring training games. Uh, this is uh, hi highly fought over, the idea that, you know, something might be captured that would be inappropriately communicated. It's, it's just that, it's that last divide, right, between the personal experience of a player in the game and, 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 and what he does on the field. Um, and and that, that kind of thing is, is something that we, you know, we, we might give a little bit more, more, more access to. What it, what it means to be, um, to, to be getting to the point where you all sit relatively passively in that audience and experience what happens on this stage, being a part of that process, getting there, can make you feel like you're more a, particip a participant in it. Yeah, right? I, thought, I was thinking about that last night at the Barbary Coast concert. There was some, I happened to be sitting fairly close and watching some exchanges going on between a couple of the cellists, and I, I'm sure many of you thought this also. What are they saying to each other? What is the conductor saying beyond just giving the bead and indicating certain you know, interpretive nuance and so forth. What's going on communicatively up there? We're experiencing the communication in one way, but there's lots going on up here. And might there be ways of sort of opening that, that seemingly locked treasure chest of processes? A absolutely. I mean, have, have we ever really given voice to musicians or have musicians permitted their voice other than what it is they train so hard and hone so, so, so uh, excellently? as it relates to what they do, right? So here, here's an example of something I've thought about. It could be a neat parallel. Um, I'm from Boston, so I'm going to give an example that relates to the 04 World Series, which was a very exciting one for me and for fans from Boston. When we did that, that World Series film, we offered a, um, or, or actually it was another program that was not unlike the World Series film, we offered a alternative soundtrack where you could choose the narrator of that particular film to be either Joe Torre or Terry Francona. Right, but you heard the managers. You don't normally hear talking. You see them with their funny faces in the dugouts. Right, narrating the experience of that tremendously exciting uh, uh, postseason series. What might that mean if we heard a soloist do that in conjunction with the concerto that he's playing this evening, um, in a second screen experience that you might you might have in conjunction with watching a broadcast, or that you might have uh, in conjunction with listening to to a recording. Um, or hearing those two cellists talk about what it means. What if we had all of the members of the orchestra might talking their way through a performance that you could, you could have one way into it that's other than the watching of them playing what they do and the listening to what they Who do. Who knows, the cellists might say things that are more uh, censorable <laughs> in the shortstop. <laughs> it's true, know. it's true. Well, let's talk about, uh, because we're here to talk about audiences, let's talk about the ways in which sports audiences are similar to classical music audiences and, and different from classical music audiences and how that informs some of the things that orchestras might do. All right, um, well, the, the similar ones are probably pretty, uh, pr pretty obvious right off the bat, right? Um, both forms of entertainment exalt virtuosic, li the live experience of virtuosic performance in a local and, and uh, locace, uh, lo yeah, location based environment, right? Doesn't mean you can't experience that outside of there, but that's what's exalted, right? The being there for the game, the being there for the, for the concert. Um, audiences are, as we heard in our last, uh, in our last panel, for both of these, uh, these art and sport forms, aging. Uh, at least in the, tr in the areas of the traditional tr uh, touch points, so the live attendance and, and the broadcast. Um, those are, those are some, some basic ones there. Where the differences are, uh, exist and where we might do some interesting sort of putting a, putting a lens on what we do for, for performing arts and, and looking through a couple of, of the things that sport does are 
offering platforms for engagement and, and participation by the audience. I think historically, and also more recently with technology, we've seen a, a greater activity of sport in giving platforms for participation by the audience. Think about it just from, from the youth standpoint, right? L Little League has, has the mandate of congressional charter in America. <laughs> Okay, we heard the equivalent for that, of course, is in Venezuela, El Sistema. Yeah. I don't know that we have that uh, uh, here, here, here in America yet. Um, but but that's, that's one thing right there from the, from the youth engagement standpoint. Um, from even just pre-game, during game, and post-game, we've got platforms for participation that exist much more robustly in sport. Pre-game, batting, batting, what's batting practice? Right, batting practice is a chance to experience the, the players uh, in, a, in a more informal environment. Um, to see them make mistakes, that's okay, it's not forbidden. Um, to perhaps get an autograph, to engage and interact with the, uh, the players, so to speak. Um, I don't know that our pre-concert lectures do, do that by way of participation. Now, they certainly, there's an, in, there's an information flow, that's, that's for sure, but it's not participatory in the same sort of way. I'm not saying it needs to be, but there might be an opportunity for us to do something that's a little bit more participatory. Post-game. We've got the equivalent now on many platforms of talk shows, right, sports talk shows, where everybody's voice is, is if not valued, at, at least um, authorized, yeah. right? Um, do we offer that through, do we actively facilitate that, curate that as performing arts organizations, or, or are we scared of it? Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's an interesting space as well. Those conversations are happening anyway, but might we actually want to facilitate them to, to, really, inv uh, to, to really have folks feel they have a voice in their experience. Yeah. Um, and then just, you know, things like uh, fantasy camps, fantasy leagues, those sorts of things where there's control exercised by, you know, by the fan in and around the, the, the thing that they have a passion about um, is, and, and participation. I think that's, that's something that, that not as much of happens here. The example that was just given of the community music makers is a great, I think to me, that's the example of, of the fantasy um, fantasy camp, right? Uh, for those of you that don't know, fantasy camp is like when you get to go onto the, the, the sacred, hallowed field of, of, of your, your, your team of, of, of dreams and interact maybe with a few former great players, but to experience that sacred place as your own, right? I, I feel that when I sit in this audience, because when I lived in this great city, I had the pleasure of singing with the San Francisco Symphony Chorus. And I feel more vested in this hall for having performed on this stage. And, and would, had I, had I been a part of the choral community group that came in here. Just like fans do when they get to do sleepovers in AT&T Park, right? There, there's something about that connectivity with the space that gives you participation that's it's exciting. It's true, it's very true. I was thinking as you're talking also in a, sort of another area that, that Major League Baseball, MLB.com, all the teams have a site. And, you know, I go on my team's site, the Phillies, and, and uh, read sort of woefully and schadenfreudely about, uh, about, <laughs> about the, the team's woes and so forth. I wonder if, you know, if we could encourage the audience to speak up that way in classical music also. After the concert, some sort of forum for, you know, everybody applauds and that's one kind of connection we make. But I, I often feel, I feel it with m myself and with my neighbors also, that... Uh, you know, there's more to be said. There's still, the, the connection keeps going. The music keeps ringing as you're going home. What if there was some way to, you know, in, engage the audience further outside the temporal walls of the concert as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and one of the big differences, I think, between, between the arts and sport is, I don't, know that, I don't know that our performing arts organizations, certainly our schools less and less, unfortunately, are, are giving, are vesting our fans with the vernacular to be able to, um, to to feel like they can they can be at that table and, and, and talk the same way that people do in sport. Um, and so I might encourage performing arts organizations um, to be to be thinking proactively about how how we can do that, right? Um, and also this 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 historical notion of curation coming from one space, from an expert on high, is something that's being challenged every day with, with the democratization of, of, uh, of entertainment participation that technology offers, right? So cur curation 15 years ago may, may have been more about an expert saying that this, this is what goes together and here's your, here's your, your, your package. Uh, today, you might argue that curation is as much, think about completely out of sport, completely out of performing arts. Um, it's, it's crowd wisdom, right? It's 
Uh, it's algorithms. If you light X, you will like Y when you go for the 15th time onto Amazon.com. And it's experts. And, and maybe our notions of curations are going to be impacted by that. There might be something a little scary about the idea that crowd wisdom is going to be, uh, is going to be influencing these things. Right? I mean, social media is, is in many, many ways uh, about, and, and, and whether we want it to happen or not, it is about the seeding of, of brands in some ways to the customer. The customer is increasingly in charge. How will that find a way, uh, or how might that be impacting how we're going to be how we're going to be curating? Yeah, I was thinking of a discussion with my daughter, who's 20, and she and her friends, you know, have want no nothing to do with restaurant critics. I mean, Yelp is where that's where the wisdom of the crowds is. Exactly. Might that somehow, you know, come over into the? Well, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing because your charge at Lincoln Center is about the digital realm and, and, and the media. Let's talk about some of the things that you're thinking about and how, how you're starting to push the envelope there at Lincoln Center. Yeah, well I can tell you that the digital strategy there is, a, is an evolving one. Um, just the, the, the mere creation of this role, uh, a, a chief digital and me media role is a new one um, for the performing arts generally at, at an executive level and certainly new for, for Lincoln Center. Um, I, I can tell you that the, the priorities for, for for Lincoln Center, as it's, as it's moving forward, is, is to really be using technology in the following ways. We, we, we must, we have a mandate to be deploying, leveraging technology to engage our audiences, take those people who are already existing audiences, whether casually or whether a avid, passionate fans, and giving them new points and, and increased ways of, uh, of accessing that content. Um, we, we have a mandate to be using that technology to be growing audiences, to be finding audiences where they have not existed before. Um, this means beyond uh, the, the barriers of, of whether it's socioeconomic for being able to find your way to a hall that way, or even geographic, um, and then certainly educationally, right? So those are, those are going to be uh, key, key, key parts of, of, of what we're doing. Um, I think the... Uh, I, I, I think just, I'll say it over, uh, over and over when I'm talking about what technology can do and what we're doing, is, is offering additional ways in. Is it with, and, and we'll be experimenting as we do it. Is it with free webcasts for certain things? Is it with, uh, yes, it will be. <laughs> um, is it taking the traditional way that we have given audiences access uh, by way of public television and, uh, and, and, up, and upping that ante with second screened experiences that allow some of the things I talked about at the beginning, right? Ways in and, and in engagement with, with artists uh, in, in ways that they haven't had a chance to before, absolutely. Um, and then just d data is also a real huge, like, holy grail of, of, uh, of digital strategies right now. So making a priority out of getting that data and mining that data, data for your audiences in at least a couple ways uh, to be able to reach and segment and target your, your audiences, and to allow those folks in turn to be able to meaningfully mine and make sense of what it is you offer content-wise. Yeah. One thing technology is, is, is so much about is about speed and immediacy and the sense of being there almost before the event happens, and certainly while it's happening. Whereas in the classical music field, technology has tended to be things that are sort of polished after-the-fact products. LP recordings, CDs, digital downloads, great performances kind of things. Mm. How can those two sort of seemingly distant points come together? I mean, you talked about, I mean, might we have seen, you know, might there be a way to break the sort of the union stranglehold and some of the other traditional restraints on that sort of thing? And for, a, you know, some of the Barbary Coast concert could have been live streamed, for example. I mean, are those kinds of things that where, where you have a sense of it's happening in Davies right now and I'm at home right now and I want to be there, I'm seeing a little bit of, I'm getting the taste, it's going to drive audiences here more. Is that, is that one place we might be going? Uh, absolutely. There's, there's an interesting irony, actually, if you think, if you think about it, about this, this perfectionism and excellence that has animated media releases. This, I like to call it the polishing of your, of your brand or, or, your, or your, uh, your, your audio legacy, right? This idea that we're not going to let live anything that wasn't this close to perfect. When actually what we're in the business of uh, on a daily basis is live performance where things can and do go wrong, right? The horn might muff the... 
<laughs> the solo. Uh, the cell phone it, it might happened. go off in the middle the of the solo. The cell phone might go off, exactly. And, uh, and, and so it, it's, a, it's a funny dynamic, right? But, but, it's, but it's a baggage that we bring from a, from a media standpoint as to what, what, has, been a, what has been a priority. And it, it certainly made sense 10, 20 years ago. Um, getting everyone to rethink what the power of media is in this day where even if, even if we forbid someone, you know, the, 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 the capture of, of, of what it is we're doing in Hull, it's happening anyway, and it's finding way, its way out there, right? The, many of you may remember La Scala a season or so ago, the, the booing off a stage by, by a tenor. This was up on YouTube. It was all over YouTube. All over YouTube, yeah. with dozens of, uh, you know, of postings, not just, 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 just a single one. This is the new world we live in. If we take the approach to media, to intellectual property, and I, I come from a background of intellectual property law, if we, if we take the, the founding father's notions of what ownership of content means, to an age in which anybody and everybody can put it all out there, um, we're, we're going we're gonna to lose opportunities, I, I think. Now, it's not, it's not a simple snap of the fingers. It, it, it really isn't. And I, and I don't even think it's as easy as saying, let everybody you know, do, what they, do what they want to in halls. Uh, although I will tell you, I was out at the, the National Association of Broadcasters speaking on a Society of Motion Picture Television Engineers co conference or something a week or two ago. And uh, on an alternative content in theaters, in cinemas, uh, a set of panels, where you had the scandalous and sacrilegious statements of, you know, uh, of the heads of cinemas saying, you know what, in a few years' time, what you may be hearing before you start your movie is not please turn off your, mo your mobile devices, but please turn them on. And, and so what, what kind of world might be that one that, you know, that, 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 that we live in? Um, and I think about this stuff a lot. I mean, we all talk about tweet seats and does it make sense to have that and, you know, in, in, in halls. And, and the funny thing is we actually have to be thinking way past that, right? On, on the Lincoln Center campus in conjunction with uh, our, 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 our great resident organization, the New York Philharmonic, we have the challenge of a, of a hall renovation and the exciting opportunity of a hall renovation ahead of us. Several years down the, 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 the line. Tweet seats will be as old in that age as I don't even know what to, to liken it to. Maybe it's uh, eight tracks today, right? So really, it, it will be. We talk about oh, the distraction of screens in the in the hall. You've all read the the article where Google glasses are going to let us, without any distraction to anybody else, have all kinds of information coming into us that you can't even. You may be doing it right now without me knowing it, right? I You're am reading indeed. your script. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching a ball game right now. <laughs> exactly, and a, and a number of husbands will be doing that. I'm kidding. In uh, in, in 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 hall, that's how we're going to build our audience. I'm kidding. Uh, but that's, but that's, we have to get past this, you know, thinking about literally what is happening today. That's one of the challenges for our, our industry is being reactive. We have to be proactive. We have to, we know that we are in the midst of a mobile and a tablet explosion right now, right? In the middle of 2014, there'll be more mobile tablet, uh, tablets rather in production than combined laptops and desktops. What are we doing to be there? What are, we, what are we doing now as a performing arts organization to be there, not to respond to it once it's happened? Uh, you know, baseball was one of the first to be in the app space, right? It was one of the first to release the, the, uh, the, the MLB at, at bat uh, app, and it remains the number one sports, sports app. What's the equivalent of that for us? Now, again, as nonprofits, we don't have the leisure of being able to, you know, spend down a whole bunch of, of, of dead ends or anything like that but it doesn't excuse us from being proactive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, all you have to do, it's a great point about technology, that whatever you think you're dealing with now, you won't be dealing with. I mean, all you have to do is thinking about the resistance to super titles, you know, not so, not so very long ago. I Perfect mean, example. In the last 30 years. Yeah. And now, I mean, you know, it's just, it's the battle long since passed over that turns out to be great. That's technology for the audience. It absolutely enhances the experience. Why couldn't it be about, we don't know yet? Right. That was, that was a back of seat digital distraction that was going to happen, quote, over my dead body, said great maestros of yore. It, did, it happened over their bodies, and they were not dead, and, and in, or arguably has revolutionized uh, the, the, the art form for, uh, at, at least for Americans, for whom, you and know. E even the Met, which was sort of the, uh, the National League holding out against the designated hitter, even they fell eventually. <laughs> There's so much more to talk about. We hope you will come back. Um, this whole question of audiences is, is 
fascinating, and we will indeed hear more from you when we come back. So we'll be back in about 15 minutes. Thank Thanks. you.